I think it's starting out with just understanding that your choices matter, your voice matters, your life matters. And so the way that you choose to live it, the way you choose to pursue um, your own kind of path really truly impacts the world around you. Every choice you make impacts the world around you. And so how can we utilize those choices to really um, promote like a healthy and sustainable world that sustainability and talking about it with all three E's. So economics, environment, and ethics. And so how do we kind of unite those and really um, promote that into our future? And so um, I think, yeah, making sure that you understand where your food comes from and how it's produced, um, the transparency of beyond just what you think of as, I think sometimes local food, it's kind of, um, is underrepresented in the way it's thought about. Um, a lot of the times, it's, at least when I'm talking to different individuals within the community, we're talking about local food. They're like, oh yeah, well I bought, I think two tomatoes, last week from the farmers market so i support local farmers um, maybe expanding that mindset a little bit and understanding that you can basically you can get everything that you would need to sustain yourself from the farmers around us and so it's just about maybe being a little bit more creative in how we are cooking and how we're eating um, whether that be seasonally and um, direct or um, just truly understanding kind of and, and that's also can be very difficult because it can be uh, it's quite tasking to figure out where who to buy from and where to do that and I think that's kind of actually the point of like why all three of us are speaking today is this is the world that we're pursuing to make this easier and more accessible and this should be something that was talked about more and we understand more that just healthy food would solve so many issues and having like a really robust system we would have, if we had a smaller supply chain and a smaller, small food, essentially, we'd be more agile and equipped to transition to um, kind of the um, rising issues on any given day. So right now we're seeing so many weaknesses in the food system that exists because it's controlled by such a corporate structure. Um, so I would say, honestly, yeah, figuring out, finding a farmer near you, buying direct, um, finding out ways to support your local agricultural system. So, um, and staying updated on what's happening in the world around you with that. So I think maybe um, diversifying your social media feed, following some farmers, um, I know, or joining a listserv. There are so many good resources within Minnesota that do such a wonderful job of promoting education and promoting um, networking opportunities. So Sustainable Farming Association, I think I saw Teresa on here. Um, Renewing the Countryside, I think Jan's on here. Um, we follow Sprout's newsletter um, and let's see, I have some In Her Boots through Moses Organic Farming Association, Minnesota Grown. Um, and I think I, Erica should be sharing some of these too. So hopefully that it's not just, you don't have to write all these down, but um, just make sure you're actually like applying, trying to diversify your knowledge set and understanding how the food system works as a whole and truly how that affects every single one of us individually. Um, these are not just individual issues. They truly leak into everything. I truly believe food controls the world. And so through some format or another, that's truly what can unite us. It's what we all need to live. Um, and is kind of how we come to, can come together in this. I mean, if you look at history and culture, everything kind of is surrounded, is just surrounds food. Um, if you think about art and tradition and um, life. It's just all about food. And so staying connected to that world and understanding the development of how we are here today and how we kind of move forward in a more beneficial way. It is. It's terrifying. It's scary. It's big. Um, but I do believe if we all come together, it makes it a little bit more simple and it makes it more um, of a community. And with community, we can truly make a difference. Wonderful. Thanks, Fallon. Danny, what's your response? Same. I'll reiterate from Noreen, definitely uh, your dollar is your voice. And so looking for your, your local farmers around you um, and that your voice matters, definitely Fallon. And so with those two combined, um, I wonder if I can recommend if there's a way, I always see, you know, sorry, I stutter three things sometimes. Um, it seems that people have access to things determined by their social circle. And so I am 
living in luxury and in privilege and being surrounded by so many people that have access to knowledge of these food systems or have access to knowledge of these resources, um, whereas my other social circles previously did not. And so where and when we can spend our food dollars to support the local food economy, but use your voice to activate, I guess, and inform the people that are around you. Um, and I wonder if I annoy my friends now in talking about this um, ad nauseum, but what it's doing is building what it can do dollars, voice, is building your own new social circle on the issues that you care about and that you're passionate about. So you're building your team. So it just happened to be at Boys Fort, met um, someone that wants to get 80 acres to be a farmer, another uh, meat processor. Um, it's, and it's so cool, had I not talked about these things with them, might not have come around to start forming this informal community advocacy group for food sovereignty. So with your dollars, with your voice, you can, you can start building your, your community base just right around you that we have brilliant, smart, hardworking people in our families, in our churches, um, in our social settings that care about these things. And maybe we just don't know. So the more that we talk about it, the more that we can vibe off of one another and, and grow this thing as a real movement of the people. Because um, pe people matter, we matter. Um, and this beautiful food, I just love this poster. This, this matter and this can make all the difference for the future. Um, and so I, I see the future of um, the food system after COVID. Harvest Nation, my mom had started with um, this looming fossil fuel crisis in mind to have local food, as now we're seeing pandemics, also another risk to the food chain, knowing that there are plenty of risks. So like Fallon was talking about, the less number of hands that the food has to go through and keeping it small food, we have food security and you know that, that worry about some sort of apocalyptic future, not so much as a worry knowing that our food sources are, are saved, um, are safe, and that food does win and lose wars. So it is, it is kind of a big deal. Thank, thanks so much, Danny. And just to uh, build on what Danny just mentioned for our next question is really looking towards the future and and we all know that you don't have crystal balls, but when you think about looking towards the future, um, how do you think COVID-19, and we've touched on this, how do you think COVID-19 will change um, the future of our food systems? And then I just wanted to add into, how do you see food as a unifier also? How can food serve as a unifier? So why don't we start again with Noreen on that question? Um, with COVID, we really learned a lot about our food system. Uh, I think before if you were in a room and you said you're a producer or farmer, they'd say, oh, okay. But then they're like, wait a minute, do you have flour? Do you have rolled oats? And pretty soon they were trying to make that connection with you. So before COVID, they would just go or have their groceries delivered. When those shelves became vacant, all of a sudden, they reached out to a lot of farmers and it was very fast. So for us as COVID, having local food, we also have to talk about what you can do and that's eat healthy food. That's the only, and you know, be safe using procedures uh, to kind of decrease your exposure. But we have some of the most nutritious food in the world and uh, I've worked close with the biochemistry department and the farm will work with the University of Wisconsin right now to really look at our grains even more in soil health. So when we have higher nutrition food, it's so much better for all people. So when we compete in the marketplace, it's kind of the why of local food. So we found that the grains actually have very extremely high antioxidants compared to any in the world that we could find. Uh, the rolled oats, we didn't know had a probiotic in it. We had no idea. So I think getting that message to people to make the decision, and also what I've really enjoyed is that I all of a sudden I'll get a phone call from somebody in New York, I did this yesterday, wanting, you know, I'm having problems with my bread. Okay, well, I'll help you. So I never had that before. I had somewhat before, but people, there was a question actually in the chat, is that they want to know 
uh, how to do things. And the grandma that was teaching them is no longer, um, you know, doing that. They're usually the, the grandma that bought the white bread. So I see this resurgence of people, very highly skilled that want to make their own bread. I don't know if that's going to return after they go back to their lives and get busy. I think also we have to figure out delivery systems because when you compete with somebody like uh, a company that delivers to their door for a busy mom, you know, how, how is that going to work with us? Because it takes a little extra effort to reach out to that farm. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if we can come together, maybe with felons help at Sprout or something to, to make it very easy for people, we have to make it easy. And then also for them to understand the why, uh, you know, what you're giving your child does matter for brain development, what you eat does matter. So I think uh, it's gonna change very quickly and I, I'm starting to see more of it, of the why. And the price points, you know, too, if you've got a third world country, that's very difficult to compete with. But if we talk about the goodness of that and supporting your neighbor, that goes a long ways. Wonderful, thanks. Fallon, why don't you go next? Yeah, um, I would say I think we've learned so many lessons from this kind of this pause that we've had to take um, on like a global scale. Um, and there have been a lot of problems that have been really highlighted um, within the pandemic and such. Um, and I think that these problems, I've really, this is the most I've ever seen people come together to really try to figure out how to solve these issues. Um, on a larger scale, um, especially when it comes to local food. There's been very pervasive issues within the food system for decades, but this is the most conversations I've ever had about it. So I'm very optimistic that we can come together and figure out how to create more robust, resilient local food chains um, because then create more food security because food security is national security and it's what supports local economies, especially within rural areas. I mean, most of our economy surrounds agriculture. And so if we can do that at a local scale where we can actually feed ourselves um, and feed the people that are producing our food, um, which are sometimes the most food impoverished, which is just crazy to think about. Um, but I think I see coming out with a, hopefully a more, a larger understanding of why, what food security means for one and why that matters. And so um, I think this is going to be a unifier in um, having more conversations about how we can create a more inclusive food system, um, making sure that farmers are paid fair prices, um, looking at ways to get farmers access to different markets, um, and making sure that food is accessible to everyone, no matter where, what your background is, what your income level is, um, or who you are. I mean, it's something that should be a very inclusive topic. It's what we all need to live. Um, and so I think sometimes local food is seen as kind of like an elitist topic. Um, and I think that is shifting a little bit in the fact that local food systems are what can protect us um, just on a day-to-day -day basis and that's kind of what creates resiliency with a kind of a combination of like food, art, and culture give us vitality and resiliency as an area. So um, kind of coming together around these topics and realizing that we can take a pause and realize what's important and bake the bread for ourselves instead of kind of giving into this busy world and having to Oh, and go for this convenience route um, that doesn't necessarily support healthy people or a healthy food system or a healthy world. And so I think coming out of this and just really taking this time to educate ourselves um, and really work to create a more just future. Great. Thanks, Fallon. Danny. I, I think really what I hope to come out of this as people are having more conversations about food, nutrition, wellness out of COVID, um, that we see and can lobby uh, for dollars to be invested in, in small farmers, um, small food economy, economies, seeing it as a uh, economic development tool. Literally, if you think about our bodies and um, human capital pools. We need 
lots of healthy humans um, to do the good work that needs to be done in the world. And I don't know if that's a selling point or a shift for a financer on the other side that maybe is looking for um, community development work. Um, and maybe we can have a conversation in the Q&A if anybody wants to take that on, how that might be seen as a spin tactic. I mean, but it's true, right? We need healthy bodies to continue um, community uplift, well-being, um, to make good changes. But when a lot of our, I'll say from Boys Forward, a lot of our citizenry aren't feeling well um, because of bad food, I would say a lot of times and some other issues, it's hard to show up at the table for the things that we care about. We can make it once, twice, but over time, some of the um, health barriers, um, it, it's really important to invest, I think, in, in people's bodies. And I don't know how to frame that. And so maybe out of um, this pandemic, we'll see how important it is to have healthy bodies and that investing in, in good nutrition for people is a direct correlation. I'm sure there's probably some economists out there with, for every good food dollar you invest in somebody, you'll get $10 back on your return for how, much, how productive they are in society. But I hope that out of this, we'll see, yes, having good nutrition and great immunity is a positive investment for those that care to think in dollar worth versus human worth. Um, and so, yes, I, I'll end with that point. Okay. Thanks so much, Danny. And um, now we're going to move to um, audience Q&A. So remember to, if you have questions, put them in the chat and Erica is going to uh, pull thematic questions together. So Erica. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all the questions you've already had and the really good conversation that's happening in the chat. That's really exciting to see too. Uh, just a reminder that we will have those resources. We've been kind of compiling a list, so we'll have those available after on the website. Um, I wanted to actually just stay on that topic of equity because it's kind of in that chat a lot. We've been talking about, and this goes to what you were just saying, Danny, too, a lot. We've been talking a lot about equity and about voting with your dollar, and those all are sort of connected in some way. Um, but I'm wondering if, so one, on one hand of that, where what you were saying, we want to pay farmers a fair wage, but would also be able to have people who maybe can't pay that larger amount for the food be able to be part of the system as well. So in what ways, not only just on a micro level, but maybe even some specific examples of a macro level of the where our dollars are going on a larger scale. So micro to macro, what are some like specific examples of ways that we, we can start to change that system? And I kind of feel like the work you're doing is part of that, but can you think of any ways that people can start to be part of that change even more? Noreen, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think, yes, it is. And it's also taking care of our neighbor. Um, in real communities, you're probably volunteering more than uh, the city counterpart, actually. You're on the fire department, you're on the township board. Um, so I, I think also looking at food, uh, there was artisan collaboration, grain collaboration had where you could, neighbors loaf. And we participated. So I said, if anyone bought flour or rolled oats or things that I would donate to people that lost their jobs. So that little, that little statement, and it's not about me, but it's about the community. They rallied. So I think we were up to 500 loaves that we could donate of really wonderful, nutritious bread for people to eat. So I think sometimes whatever group you belong to, you can also, um, even this 100 rural women, you can think, well, okay, if I buy something, then let's see if they'll donate to someone else or let's pay it forward. Those little acts can make such an impact to people right now. Uh, and farmers locally, uh, they figured out how to donate to some of the um, places like the food pantry. Uh, the government has kind of made a segue for that. Also, look at what you could grow in your backyard uh, with Teresa with the Sustainable Farming Association. She was so savvy that she was able to get a grant to provide asparagus crowns for 22 special needs farmers. It's phenomenal. It was like she had an, uh, a magical wand. 
And that was, they were growing food, they're growing food for others, and they're all special needs. It's called Farm in the Dell. So, you know, by her releasing that grant to help these farmers, they are feeding other people and themselves. So sometimes it's not as hard as we think it should be. Um, it can actually be very easy to, to help others and feed others um, as well. Cool. I want to um, just, and you know, all three might have thoughts on this too, but someone was just asking about, um, I want to hear more from Fallon and Danny too, but uh, Noreen, and this is related to the equity question, that's why I'm bringing it up, about um, land access too for farmers. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? They just asked the question. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I actually um, think land access is more accessible than we make it. Um, there's public land that can be used for, for the good, um, for growing, and every farm, every farm has border lands that I think they would be happy to provide that land to someone, like we are, with the French chef who is food to table. Well, it's getting a little bit much for me to do the high tunnel and everything, so I said, okay, you know, so much we'll donate, so much you have for your restaurant, so much we'll have too. I think there's, if we work together, that land access issue isn't as hard. Every farm has land that they would be happy to work with someone. Cool, thanks. All right, Fallon, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so a lot of what uh, we do at Sprout, we kind of take a holistic approach to, um, health through a food lens. And so um, we run a lot of different programs with different um, groups in recovery, really of any form, um, food insecure individuals, um, veterans, um, and, we have, and caregivers. Um, and we bring them into the kitchens at the Sprout Space. We have two fully licensed commercial kitchens and um, we cook together. Um, and we share stories and we share recipes and um, we teach those skills about how to take um, this raw agricultural product and how to prepare it. Um, so we go through like basic food safety um, and preparation and then food storage um, and kind of just the basics of food preparation, but then kind of get more into just different, um, then we share recipes and we talk about um, what our grandmothers used to cook for us and uh, different family stories and such. Um, and I think this is just kind of represents a more, um, I don't know, equitable lens to the, how we approach food. So sharing a meal together um, and what comes out of that meal is so beautiful. You have stories, you have skill building, um, and you have this feeling of accomplishment that you created something with your own hands. And so these are programs that we've been running now and then go along with a donated CSA that are currently all grant funded. And so I understand that this maybe is not the perfect picture of um, making food accessible for the long term, but mostly trying to build individuals in a holistic manner that they have the ability to do things themselves and so teaching them how to grow their own food how to prepare it how to store it um, and how to kind of accomplish these things on your own um, while giving them access to community resources and um, things that exist that they can be utilized um, so i think ways that you can kind of support this um, in really any community is just looking into um, different ways to just become involved within the food system. So maybe working within a community garden or trying to develop one and then have plots that are for community members that can't afford to rent them um, or are donated or just have some sort of structure like growing together out of Moorhead, Minnesota, which is a um, growing ministry. And I did not send you that link, Erica. I'm sorry, that one's just coming to mind, but I think you know that one. So. Um, but just having that viewpoint that there are so many things that we can do with our own hands. And so how do we truly inspire everyone to have um, the courage and the um, confidence to pursue these things? I know this is something that I've even learning with myself, just like the confidence that I've had just learning different skills, like cooking and gardening and um, 
all everything that can come out of food. Um, and it's really built me as a person and how I view the world and how I see myself um, and my ability to do things. And so I think transferring that to other individuals and empowering people through this lens. Um, I don't necessarily, nobody really wants charity, really, right? We want to all be self-sufficient and we want to support ourselves. And so I think food is the best way to do that. You give somebody the gift of knowledge of how to garden and prepare food. I think that goes such a long way. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I'll leave it at that thought, I guess, for now. I could ramble on for hours, but. <laughs> Question on land access. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. So I think a lot of people may be familiar, if you're in the food world, with David Abbas and his uh, food research, and um, he's presenting uh, a project, um, land a land trust project. So it's going to have, I think, two kind of different types of programming. One for beginning farmers, um, where you know there could be regular housing um, for the farmers on the land, and then have, of course, the support and the services around that um, through the land trust. So anything from legal to other overhead admin through the trust. Um, he's gonna, he offered another one, which I'm more excited about, um, or yeah, I am, um, for the Arrowhead region, the 1854 ceded territory. That's where the Ojibwe tribes of the Northland um, signed over ceded territory for in exchange for reservation lands. Um, we still have hunting and fishing rights. Of course, Henry Schoolcraft left out the uh, mineral rights. Um, we can talk about that on a different webinar. Um, but instead, as sort of a, a, I know this term might be loaded, but reparations type idea where uh, people can donate their land. Um, maybe you, Normally, I think it's done through a will. Donate their land to this land trust to provide access to uh, native people of the area to hunt and fish and gather um, because like our land base is reservation land and it is smaller especially at Boys Fort. Um, I don't know a lot of landowners that I could go and ask hey can I exercise my um, treaty rights there's not a lot of places to do so and so this is opening up um, some private lands to do just that working with the 1854 treaty authority um, and so we can relearn our ways, and there could be, we were seasonal people, there could be seasonal housing encampments, and we could, you know, like Fallon said, food is a connection to culture and identity, um, get that back for ourselves as much as we can. And so whenever you see those types of initiatives, um, please, please support them and please be engaged and uplift them, um, even through social media. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so, cause like my grandpa, he was a guide, uh, big hunters. Nickname was One Shot Bob. And that was income too. Um, wild racing, probably about 20% of our family's former annual income. Um, my mom and her sisters were the best dressed in the Tower School of Northern Minnesota. Um, and coming from a reservation in a rural town, going to school like that is hard. So even having access to you know, some funding for decent clothes to participate fairly in school and in the economy and in politics. Um, I'm really excited for that land trust idea because um, we could have more income for our people that is uh, traditional and it works better. Um, so yeah, David Abaz, and he's just starting some planning meetings and conversations around the, those two land trusts. I, I don't know if he's imagining them being held in one space or if they will be separate. I imagine you know, maybe a combination of the two. Um, so anybody that wants to get involved, I'll, I'll put my email um, in the chat box here. and It might be a part of the rural women's bio information too, but just in case. Um, and if anybody has land and wants to just invite tribal persons out to exercise their hunting and treaty rights, you let me know. 18, again, 1854 ceded territory, if you Google that. Um, awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a question. It was asked earlier um, about if you have, this is totally shifting gears, if you have any advice for people 
that are starting their own gardens and really getting involved in creating their own spaces for food um, in their backyards. I feel like we've seen so many people <laughs> be doing that with COVID. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for those folks. Maureen? Um, yes, I do. So um, with gardening or getting started, I think uh, especially now, Erica's in your generation uh, to do it together because sometimes it just seems kind of daunting to launch this and the weeds come and it can be overwhelming. Um, one of the really fun things, uh, uh, my son was attending the U of M and kind of didn't want the food service, didn't want to support that. So he and his friends banded together. We'd go to the farmer's market and pay the farmer a, a good, you know, for their produce and they cook together and uh, this is before COVID it was so popular that they had formed three groups they had 60 students making their own food together so I think the togetherness uh, you know learning from someone like the master gardeners at the U of M you know asking them questions your extension people and then find a, a grandma type that maybe it's too much work for her for a garden and you can plant with your friends. She'd love to see you and probably even bring you bread. So I think, you know, utilizing good for your grandma or that senior, good for you and your group to embrace that because we've skipped working together with multi-generations. And I think that's where the break in knowledge is. So we have to kind of reinvent that or, or bring it together. Uh, but doing it together as a group and and also sharing, you know, making a food together when we can all get together it would be great. Uh, I think those simple things are more encouraging than if you just do, do it by yourself, it can be overwhelming balancing all that. And then as a group, donate to the food pantry or a family in need. Boy, what the impact could be. One little tenth of an acre could probably feed many, many families, probably 20 to 30. Great, thanks. Alan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, so this year actually is the first year I've started my very own garden. Um, the first year that I haven't really been under the supervision of anybody else. And it was so intimidating. I like wanted everything to be so perfect um, and have um, like the healthiest layout and best companion planting. And um, for a while I was just like so paralyzed by wanting the perfect garden that it took me a long time to actually um, just pursue it. Um, so I would say uh, maybe just, you know, having the confidence in yourself to first, like, I guess, do some research. Um, there are a lot of super useful sites that have um, very good information. And Minnesota Extension has a great website. Um, Happy Dancing Turtle. Um, and just, I mean, there's so many resources out there. And depending on just kind of what style you want to pursue, I think um, that also kind of matters in like your soil type and such. But um, yeah, it was definitely a very um, intimidating. But I worked actually uh, with my with Sustainable Farming Association to find um, some compost and manure. Um, and then I worked with a new seed company called North Circle Seeds to procure my seeds this year, which are regionally adapted. And so that's been kind of um, a fun transition. But I would say, um, I don't know, just having the, I don't know, believing in yourself that you can do this and believing in the plants, like they're so resilient, you know, you don't necessarily need to um, baby them or like have the perfect garden for something to grow. And I think that's what the point of all of this is, right? We just want something to grow and have um, some hope for tomorrow. So, you know, planting a garden is believing in tomorrow. And so I think it's just a matter of kind of going forward with that mindset um, and not getting so held up by making sure everything is perfect and learning in the process and digging in the dirt um, and being cautious of poison things. Um, I recently got poison ivy for the first time and I thought I was immune my whole life. So <laughs> I've been like slightly um, upset by that, but that's okay. So <laughs> I'm learning lessons all the time. And I think that's, I've been so excited about that is just the lessons you can learn from a garden and all the things that just the world has to teach us and like all of these, this like natural cycle has to teach us. So um, kind of being receptive to all of that um, and 
kind of go, build, growing along with your garden and allowing that to happen. You know, you can't tackle nature. You can't conquer nature. You can just work with it. So. Awesome. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. And then um, I also just quickly wanted to address um, um, a couple of different policy questions. And so, um, although I didn't have concrete examples come to mind right now, which I'm sure I will later and could also talk a long time about that. Um, but just to stay updated with some agricultural policy and issues, I think um, Land Stewardship Project does a good job of this. Um, Minnesota Farmers Union um, and maybe the Nature Conservancy, um, Soil and Water District. Um, I think those are really good ways to stay updated with kind of um, a, a pretty solid view of what's going on in the world. And I'm sure there could be a million more. And so um, please include anything else that you have in the chat, but just wanted to address that quick, but thanks. Go ahead, Danny. Danny? I believe in the power of prayer. <laughs> And the idea that you can maybe, you know, be nice to the plants or have a relationship with the plants or even just accepting it is what it is where, wherever the plant may go. And um, just the idea, the whole idea of positive thinking, if you can send your plants, if you're not, you know, a, a, a prayer type person, just sending good juju and good vibes. I think maybe in your, in the back of your head will just kind of put things at ease so no matter what happens with your garden, you're learning and whatever will be, will be. And then you can just kind of sit back. Of course, something's got to grow, right? Even if weeds take its place, dandelions, dandelion tea, say, hey, found some, some way to make use of it. So, Thank you. Um, unfortunately, that was our last question. I know I didn't address everything, but... Um, I appreciate that. I kind of think that was a nice way to end and really connection to what you're growing. Um, so thank you for all your questions. Uh, I've been making a list of all of the resources that you've all been sharing. I can tell that we have a lot of experts on the line. Um, so I appreciate all of your time. Teresa, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I'll just do a, a quick um, thank you again to our presenters and Erica and Brianna for um, helping with this meeting. Um, we're going to have another breakfast in July. It's probably going to, um, I think we're going to do it around voting. And um, please check out our website for uh, follow-up materials on this webinar. Um, we also, um, Brianna just put in the chat, we are doing a follow-up survey with folks just to sort of get your feedback and figure out how we can improve and what you'd like to see in future webinars. And just want to thank everybody and really encourage your feedback and thank everybody who participated today. So, so have a great rest of the day and um, we'll talk again in July. So thank you.